our new, how to call it, interesting series, opening for the World Championship matches, or something like that, I would say. I just thought that, well, we are less than a month before the World Championship Anand Gelfand, then instead of choosing another interesting topic, may it be Sicilian or Slav or anything like that, well, why don't we do something interesting and pretend that we can imagine, guess, or at least just have a small idea about what might we expect in the World Championship match. I, again, uh, it's, I have to, you know, with a small laugh, say that if I really knew or thought that I have a really powerful idea what will happen there, then probably I would offer my services to either a non team or Gelfan team. But because I'm doing the video here on ICC and not uh, preparing to go to Moscow to prepare one of those teams, well, let, let's take it with a bit questionable or not that certainty, but still we will have our idea what to expect or what was played and what we can, well, what those players might play. I will uh, divide this uh, series basically into two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be, well, just what might be played uh, following Anand matches in 2008 against Kramnik and in 2010 against Topalov. We will see what weapons he used. And we will do the same with Gelfand in the candidate matches where he played many games. And we will see if we will still have uh, some room. Maybe we can discuss a little bit about Anand Gelfand games themselves. Although I think that World Championship match is uh, completely different. I don't really care what Anand played against Gelfand in Linares, I don't know, 10 years ago or whatever. Uh, much more important what those played in the candidates and in the World Championships. Let's start with Anand, okay, the world champion, and the first two videos will be what possibly to expect from his play. How about an opening that he used no less than three times against Topalov? And personally, I'm not certain he will use this against Gelfand because of the different in styles, but let's go and see. The Slav, but not just the main Slav, not the complicated lines of the Slav, but going into a slightly worse endgame. Anand played it in games number 3, games number 5, and game number 8 in the match in 2010. Kramnik played the same against Topalov, and I think the reason has to do a lot with, well, first of all, a draw with Black is well, an excellent result in a match, and secondly, well, Topalov, this is not his best side of play. While Gelfand, I think playing this against Gelfand is a bit more... Um, Tricky, questionable, then against Topalov. All right, so obviously in this position, the D takes C4 line in the Slav and E6. Well, Bishop B4 followed by the P sacrifices, the main line. Anand played some games in this line. I actually remember a game he lost in Nanjing 2010 to Bakro. But against Topalov, he was in no mood for any of those complications and went with C5, E4, a take on D4 is another complicated line, but actually considered somewhat in White's favor. So it's pretty much out of play, or somewhat out of play, let's put it this way. Bishop G6. What to be played in this position? Well, really White has just two main moves. He can either play D5, or he can play Bishop E3. Well, let's look at D5, which we have well, some strong players playing, including one game of actually Gelfand from the black pieces, so we kind of have to mention it. Take on D5, and here take on G6. This is not very dangerous for black. It might look a bit, but not really, since black has very fast development. If bishop takes E4, knight D take E5, for example. And black just says enough powerful outpost in the center to give him an okay position. Shirov Gelfand, Moscow, 2006, and the game was a draw. So take back on d5, bishop d6, knight c4, takes c4 castle. Here it seems like there is one line that <laughs> seems a bit bizarre, or uh, players follow it like it's forcing moves, 
but let's just see. To me, I, I don't know, I would have no idea how to even start looking at this position, but apparently they all follow this line like they have to. Queen e7, bishop h5, aiming to provoke some weaknesses. And here, rook a, d8 is one move. Queen e2, bishop e5, king h1, g6, bishop g4. Black seems to me perfectly okay. Uh, it was actually white that won it quite quickly. Black didn't play very accurate, but black looked okay. Rajabov against Bariev from Odessa. 2007, and a more recent game, where after bishop h5, g6 immediately was played. White played a very interesting queen to d2. And here, not taking, allowing white to get very strong attack after take. Black played a very cool rook d8 with the idea that after take, queen h4, white retreated with the bishop, and black just played h5, and again, black position seemed very okay to me. Wang Hao against Li Chao, China 2011, and this game was a draw. Okay, that was just a very, very quick recap of d5. We see this line is played by enough strong players. But, bishop e3. Okay, white is on without any doubt going for a slightly better endgame. The only question is how slightly? And this is our job here to get just an idea. Well, black's main move here is to eliminate this knight. It is very important to understand that white does not want to take on g6. And the reason is because black pawn will be very compact, very powerful on the light squares, including let's put it a pawn on a6 and b7, and they will control all the light squares in the center. Let's, let's start our drawing classes. b5, c6, d5, e6, f5, g6. All those squares will be controlled by the pawns, g6, f7, e6, b7, a6. So it means that the pieces will fight for the dark squares. If the pawn control the light squares, well, we will have the pieces fight for the dark squares. So black's move, knight to d7, is very logical. And if take, this is black would be very happy. Look at that. The bishop has to go somewhere, for example, a6. Look at the dark squares that the black pieces are controlling. Black is okay plus in this position. Let's say at least okay. I, I would like black here. So white cannot really take on g6. And knight fd7 is a smart move because after knight c6, practice showed that white just got advantage in this position and actually won the two games that he was involved with, either bishop takes e4, knight d7, king e2. Uh, let me just show it quickly. Rook hd1. Uh, just very comfortable and free uh, initiative or disadvantage for white. Uh, rook c2. I mean, okay, black has this one, white will... Uh, this maneuver I found extremely attractive for white. Extremely. Uh, white just better. Kremlin, Pia Kremlin against Smyslov from 1998, and White won this game. Uh, another game played actually in the same year. White went immediately for a5, doesn't even wishing to allow Black to be able to play this a5 move. Take on c4, e5, bishop e3, bishop e4. Rook to c1. I mean, this is actually... I, I like even this play a bit more. And now look at white. The knight is blocked by... stopped by the c6 pawn. That's just great play. Hubner against Platier from Germany. A team championship to 1998. And white won this game as well. So, knight d7. 
Okay. Take, take, take. Okay, what in this position? Well, really two main moves. And we are not certain what the players are thinking, what their teams are preparing, but we can just show what, again, what was played and what we can uh, maybe anticipate or anticipate to see. A6 or Rook to C8. Well, just make a lot of sense. Knight B5 is possibly a threat in some situations. So either attacking the bishop or playing immediately A6. Let's start with A6, which was played in games number 3 and 5 in the match. And then we will go to Rook C8, that was played in game number 8. Actually, the only game that Anand lost uh, in this line. A6. Okay, there are so many moves here. Obviously, we can make a series just on analyzing this position very deeply. But let's just give some taste. Uh, two games involving Kramnik. The first one in the match against Topalov. King e2, rook g8, rook hd1, rook c8 now. Bishop c5. Well, black has to defend the g7 pawn, right? So that's why we see many times in this line this move. Rook to g8, a5. Fixing the pawns on b7, a6, and now not taking, which will leave c5, b6 very vulnerable, but bishop to b4, Topalov against Kramnik from their match in 2006, and uh, those are not really positions for Topalov to play. I mean, okay, obviously he's probably one of the strongest in the world playing those positions, but you cannot really beat Anando. Kramnik, but by being just one of the strongest, you probably have to be the strongest or close to the strongest. So, this was a draw. Aronian, uh, very impressively, in the match in 2007, a friendly match, if I'm not mistaken, it was a rapid match. H4 he played, Rook C8. And now, always the big question H6 or H5? We will see that in the match, in similar positions, Anand. Played one time h6, one time h5. Well, h6, uh, on one hand, a bit more flexible for the bishop, for the pawn structure, right? The pawn is not fixed on h5, but on the other hand, the bishop can be pushed in many lines. Again, rook g8, king out. Take, take, knight b1. Very cool move, but the knight on c3 in many lines we see is a bit restricted. And here, take h5, rook c1, and to beat Kramnik in such position is something something serious. Aronian Kramnik, Aronian won, Yerevan match 2007. All right, Topalov played rook c1 in both games in the match. Rook to g8. And here, Anand chose once to play h6, and once he chose to play h5. The first game went h6. King e2. I've analyzed a bit and I've seen some analysis of some strong players uh, regarding this game and this line. And they mentioned that king e2 might be not the best move. King f2 might be a bit more accurate. And indeed, a year after this game played, we have a strong Chinese player, Zhu Jin Chao, playing this with the white pieces and he played king f2. Uh, just to have the flexibility of knight moving to f4 in some lines, <laughs> the king is better or might be better on f2. Let's see this game. King f2, bishop d6, knight e2, king e7, h5, bishop a2, f6, g3. And there are some other possible continuations, but this is how this game followed. Zhao, Jin Chao against Grigorian from Armenia 2011, actually uh, quite a recent game from 2011, and White won this one, he's a tiny bit more comfortable. Can this be an important novelty that a non-team had seen in with h6, and that's why he played h5 in game 5? Maybe. We can only speculate, right? We are not uh, sitting or playing in each one of the team. King e2 was played by Anand, bishop d6, a5. 
Bishop before is a serious move to always to consider once the pawn is on a5. King to e7. And very slowly, you know, this bishop will get in the game. Before, Anand doesn't want any part in allowing this counterplay, and a lot of play, actually. A strong initiative, it's not just counterplay for the pawn. So he played rooks gc8, and here, this not really enough. Take with the bishop, and very slowly playing this position when black is reasonably okay. The bishop made its way from g8. Uh, this is very close to just completely equal. Maybe it's already just completely equal. Topalov against Anand from Sofia match game number three. All right, let's go back to move 15. H4, H5. Okay, most logical move here without any hesitation has to be knight e2, right? We see the bishop is more restricted to defending that. Knight e2, bishop d6, bishop e3, knight e5, knight f4. Well, black cannot easily just take because who will protect those ones? And if you're telling yourself, oh, 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 that this is just an easy immediate force draw, I would suggest to think again, this bishop... Let me just show it. Versus this bishop and the king and the seventh rank. Oh, this is extremely pleasant for white to play. I think extremely unpleasant for black. And none doesn't want any part of anything like that. Rook c8, rook bishop b3. Take, take. But this, this gave Topalov quite a nice play here. And here, here is maybe, maybe where uh, such a genius player like Topalov, where his disadvantage against Anand, Kramnik, you know, or maybe Aronian in this sense, playing those accurate moves in this position. After Bishop D2 played by Topalov, just one, one inaccurate move. Topalov is better here, he played well. One inaccurate move and Anand is just okay. After rook d1, not easy position for black. I mean, some lines, for example, bishop e3, and now if exchanging the bishops, now bishop back. Black is very much tied on this side of the board, g6, h5. The knight on f4 is great. This is why uh, possible improvement king f2 over king e2 is such an important idea. So what's so wrong with bishop d2? Oh, look at Anand. F6, one less, F6. This is the idea. If take on E6, Bishop F7, Knight D4, take, take, all right, Black has counterplay. Black is not worse. If Bishop take, basically same story. We can analyze this a bit, but okay, this is just very, very false line. Very, very, very false line. Rook has to go back. Or take on B2 is possible, or something like this. Okay, no, no difficulties at all for black. There are obviously other ideas there to consider. So once this bishop gets it back in the game, black will be okay. How serious are the pair of bishops here? Mm. Because of this weakness, probably not that much. I would think that, okay, if white pawn is on a2 and he can cover the d4 square a bit better, let's say we can take this pawn to a2 and this pawn to e3. Let's, let's just take the pawn back. Oh, no doubt white is a tiny bit better. But there are some weak spots in the center. Topalov, and I don't think anyone can really do much against Anand in this position. Well, maybe if your name starts with... Magnus and finish with Carlsen, but I also don't think so. I think, for example, playing those lines against Carlsen would be, wow, someone has to be either extremely, extremely brave or not that smart. I don't know. I would not think anyone sane would play something like this against Carlsen. Anyway, this game was a draw. This was the fifth game of the match. Anand 
most likely wasn't very, very happy with either position that he got in those games. So he played Rook C8 in the eighth game. Actually, the only one that he lost, but, well, he lost it by horrible opposite color bishop. And here, retreating with the bishop is possibility or just going immediately and exchanging it. It seems that despite the fact that in the game, Anand got, uh, sorry, Topalov got some advantage, I think it was more because of inaccuracy played by, inaccuracy played by Anand that Topalov got the advantage and not because of really anything else. So let's first of all see what's popular today. Bishop a2, a6, okay, that's, sorry, bishop a2, a6 is one possibility, a5, we're not going to analyze each and every one of those lines. Bishop e2, a6, well, let me just show quickly. Black is just all right here. Grichuk against Wang Yu from China, 2011. It seems that bishop b3 is a very cool move. The idea is, I actually kind of like the idea, to have a5 and bishop a4 as a possibility. For example, after a6, king e2, knight b8, interesting maneuver, rook hd1, and now this move. Very cool spot. And, okay, uh, how, how to stop the invasion to d7? Probably impossible. That's why you, you're not really going to take. So... Rook g8 to be able to move this bishop. But this is... White has tiny bit. And tiny bit is already quite a lot. White didn't, didn't manage to win, but Giri against Stojanovic from Bulgaria, 2012. Extremely recent game. And we will see this is where recent theory is. If not a6, then what about a5? But also here, white... Well, white is cool. Knight to b5, that's a nice spot. Not exchanging those bishops, and the bishop is finding some great diagonals. Bishop h4, rook hd1, and bishop g3. Fier against Wang Yu from the World Cup 2011, and amazingly enough, Fier won this game and the match, if I remember correctly. So Topalov went for bishop b5. Logical. We are fighting for dark squares. Let's kill this knight that controls many dark squares. a6, take, take. King e2, f6. Rook hd1, king back to e8. a5. Well, some other games have been played have been played, for example, bishop b6, bishop c5 was played in 2007, Bucharov against Amonatov, which was a draw. Uh, a very interesting game that was played after the match was rook a c1. And the reason I'm saying it's interesting because the player with the black pieces is one of Anand's most known, maybe the most known seconds, Heine Peter Nielsen. And the game followed rook c1, of course, not bishop c5, the pin, bishop e7, a5, king f8, getting the bishop in the game, maybe. Now the knight move, now king f7, capture, capture, bishop d6, stopping invasion to c7. With very small advantage for white, Wesley saw against Heinrich Peter Nielsen from Amsterdam. 2010. Uh, it was funny. White King ended up on A8, if I remember. Okay, uh, that was really, really, really funny game. <laughs> but uh, looked reasonable for Black. Worse, but reasonable. So A5. Bishop E7. Though I have to mention, Anand didn't repeat this after game 8, after he lost this one. Maybe he got tired of suffering in this position. Maybe a5 is not most accurate. May have. Probably rook a c1 played by Wesley, so after the match is a better one. Bishop b4 is a possibility here. Rook c6. After bishop e7, well, without going much, much further, white is just more comfortable here. And Okay, at some point, Anand messed it up a bit, got worse, maybe much worse. Then it went back to around equal. 
and he lost, the, well, not equal, but a drawish bishop end game, which Anand lost. So this was Topalov Anand, game number eight in the World Championship in 2010. All in all, Kramnik played this against Topalov. Anand had three games in the World Championship. All right. Well, this is something to put in our heads, and we will see if one of those players is brave enough to pull out this line again. Well, we will see another video what to expect from Anand in our next one, and then it will be Gelfand turn, and hey, then it will be just the match starting, so let's get ready. Bye-bye.